Hi, welcome to Deep Cuts, where we get a chance to talk to a smart person about a specific subject and take it that extra mile. Uh, the show's own Julia Doubleday has once again selected an amazing author and book. Can you tell us what's on tap? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Arun, and thank you all for joining us today on the committee program. Today we are talking with historian, journalist, and commentator Vijay Prashad. He is the executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and the chief editor of Leftward Books. We're talking to him today about his fantastic book, Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA, Coups, and Assassinations. So thank you so much for being here today, Vijay. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And I just want to say, like, um, I had a book that was slightly similar that re I read when I was 15 or 16 called Counter Revolution. And it was happening at the same time as I was maybe being programmed in class. This was the thing deprogramming me. And it really, like, affected my life. And so uh, when Julia brought up your book and, and mentioned it, I just wanted to say, like, there are young people who you put together such an amazing compendium of information are going to be picking this up for the first time and learning things about how America expresses power for the first time. And I just think it's a, a, a real achievement and something that's amazing. And what made you decide to do it? Right. So uh, thanks for that. That's great. Um, there's several, you know, no, no book has a single trajectory uh, and particularly nothing of this kind, at least for me. Um, so I, I'll tell you both stories, if that's OK. The first story goes back to many years ago. I um, had a very fantastic encounter with Eduardo Galliano, who, you know, I'd asked Galliano, like, how is it that you are able to write such beautiful prose about uh, such horrible things like torture and dictatorships and so on, you know? And he said, well, look, you know, the, there's no point in prose, repeating the torture, you know, there, there's no point because um, that just sort of will traumatize people. You know, there's no point doing that. Is there a way to write about something very ugly with by keeping the hope intact, by keeping humanity intact? You know, that was advice that I really took to heart. And that also made me think about the fact that readers have to be able to read a book. Um, there's a lot of conversation now, and, and I'm sorry, I'm beginning with form and not content, but this comes to the point. Uh, but, you know, reader, people say, you know, people don't read and people say, well, you know, young people don't read and so on. And I actually think that's an unfortunate way to formulate things. The issue isn't that people don't read, it's how do they read, what do they read and so on. So I decided I wanted to write a book like this, almost like a series of Facebook posts. Um, you know, each section is short. Uh, you can read the section, shut the book, come back to it a week later if you'd like, depending on, you know, the level of your precarious work. You're busy, you're, you know, distracted by a million things. So read a bit, put it away. You know, the problem with writing long chapters with a sustained argument is it requires a kind of dedication, time, discipline, and so on, which people may not have. So I had the idea of the form very much at the center of my mind. Then there was this coup against uh, Evo Morales Ayma in Bolivia in November of 2019. And that coup, of course, bothered me. I, I, you know, Evo Morales is a terrific person. 14 years he's run a government, improved the conditions of life of people in Bolivia. But what really bothered me was the liberal and to some extent left liberal consensus that Morales had been there too long, that he should go and, you know, whatever. And, you know, this is striking to me because Angela Merkel has been the chancellor of Germany longer than Evo Morales. So you have an indigenous man who's the president of a country and you can so easily disparage him. Nobody says this about Ms. Merkel. You know, she can be the chancellor. In fact, now in Germany, a lot of people suggest let her yeah. continue. You know, the, the alternatives are really bad. Let her go. So it's OK for her to have, you know, 16, 18, 19 years. But for him to have more than 14 out of the question, I found that objectionable. Lots of, you know, sensitive people saying it's not a coup. It's not a coup. It's just, you know, he overstayed his welcome, stuff like that. And I thought, wow, an entire generation, an entire generation doesn't see what ha what's happening to Evo. They don't see what happened to Manuel Zelaya in Honduras as a coup. They don't even see what happened to Hatoyama as a coup, what happened in Japan in 2009. These things are just not available, you know, the, the grammar. So I thought, okay, 
I spent, I think, a few weeks in January feverish. Uh, I know this material very well. You know, I've been a reporter long enough. I've talked to intelligence people for years. I understand this stuff. So I sat down for a few weeks in January and I just wrote this flat. Um, you know, I, I just it was there and I knew that um, the best example is Guatemala and the book, you know, the center of the book is Guatemala. The best example is Guatemala. And that's because the US government has actually told us what it did now. OK, that's a methodological point. Maybe they lied in their after action report. But if they lied, they lied in order to make a point I wanted to make. Uh, so I thought, well, let's just use their material, you know, as much as possible. Let's use the U.S. government materials to explain what the U.S. government has said and done or, you know, British government materials, other intelligence agencies. This is not a book where I've gone and done a lot of field reporting. You know, it's basically intelligence officials. It's intelligence material. And I, I've essentially said, look, this is what they said they've been up to. So why don't we right. take Yeah, seriously? I mean, um, so I think we can definitely draw this direct line between our bends in Guatemala and then what happened in 2019 in Bolivia. And what's interesting is the way the sort of media um, apologies for these actions, they don't really change shape over time. So, I, you know, I think... We've seen this same playbook repeated over and over and over again, but we treat each case as if it's this individual case and we've never seen anything like it before. Um, you know, this is just about protecting democracy, uh, even though we can go back and historically we see, OK, yeah, this was the CIA and they were involved in overthrowing this person and they were involved in fomenting dissatisfaction and they were involved in the sort of economic sanctions that lead to um, a crisis situation on the ground. So on this show, we've talked a little bit um, about, you know, how coups are constructed. But I was hoping you could speak to from Guatemala to Bolivia. What are the ingredients that go into creating the this ripe environment for a coup? Because I think one thing that's really misunderstood in the, in the public is that they think a coup is going to be called a coup and they're going to know it's a coup. And if there's any room for doubt, then maybe it's not a coup, you know? So how do we identify these things as they're unfolding? What are the what are the signs that it's happening? Well, that's interesting. Um, and so there's a reason in the center, the heart of the book I've put together is um, a manual of regime change. And the manual has several components in it, you know, including and I emphasize this a lot these two aspects, one of information warfare and the other one is getting the institutional actors prepared and ready. There's a lot of preparation that goes into making a coup. So let me talk about this first and then I'll talk about a legislative coup because that's slightly different. Um, it's a lot of preparation. You know, you got to have you got to have an ambassador on the ground who really understands power and is not afraid to exercise it. And the United States has had the capacity to train people to be superb ambassadors. I mean, there's it's a rogues gallery of thugs, you know, um, you can't blink. You really have to be tough and you have you just can't care about the consequences, you know, ride roughshod over democracy, over some, you know, campesino leader or or whatever, you know, some students in Thailand, if they're all going to die, you just have to have that fortitude, you know, to hold the course. So having the ambassador in station is very important. The ambassador working closely with the CIA and so on. We used to tell an old joke, you know, why can't there be a coup in the United States? Well, they can't because there's no US embassy there. And, you know, you have meanwhile, the center of intrigue in so many countries is the United States embassy. Um, that is a very important institutional focus. They, they have to have a liaison with the military. You got to get enough people in the military um, sold to the idea that the government, the mostly left wing government in power is a threat to the traditional order. Look, in Chile in 1970, that's when Allende wins, Salvador Allende wins an election. It's a slim margin, but he wins the election. They assassinated the, the United States government colludes in the assassination of a general who was against the coup d'etat. That's three years before the actual coup is held. You know, they go to that length to prepare the terrain for the military to be ready to act. It's important because, listen, it's not uh, clear that militaries would like to act. 
you know, often militaries can be quite um, committed to a constitution. They are against acting in this way. So you have to prepare them. You have to get them ready. And that takes work. For that, you often bring them to, you know, some military uh, universities in the United States. They might come to the School of the Americas, for instance. Um, they might come and train at West, at West Point. They might get a degree at Harvard. So you bring these you know, mid-career mid military people from the militaries in South America, in Africa, in Asia, and they come, they're flattered, they write master's degrees, you know, at Stanford University, then they go back with their, their master's degree from Stanford will get them promoted, so they accelerate to becoming, you know, people who command forces. You don't want them necessarily to be generals. You need to have people who can command, particularly in, in the capital city, who command the main garrisons. You know, they are very important. Uh, so there's that connection that's made with the military. These are the institutional supports. Then there's an information war. You delegitimize the government. You know, you start spreading all kinds of stories. And face it, any government has stories that could be made against them. You know, you either delegitimize the leader personally, their family members, or whatever it is. Information wars happen all the time. But then linked to that is you can start doing sanctions policies, economic warfare that raise the uh, social crisis in the country. You know, if you if you don't allow, for instance, a country to borrow, Richard Nixon famously tells Henry Kissinger about Chile again, we'll make the economy scream. You know, we won't allow the government of Allende to access credit. If they can't access credit, their borrowing is going to be higher, more expensive. There'll be inflation in the country. If there's inflation, living standards will decrease. If living standards decrease, people will be now open to the propaganda. You know, if you tell them, look, the, he's eating lobster in his, in his palace while you are starving. People come out angry. The military moves. People thank the military for moving. So there's a way in which the coup has to be produced. It takes a lot of preparation. It's a theater. It's theatrical. The day of the coup is a day is the opening day of the play. All the elements have to be ready. All the actors have to learn their lines. They have to hit their mark. You know, when you go to see a play, you don't want that silence. You know, you want the actor to come onto stage right when the cue is called for. They must enter. They must say, what's happening, dear? Uh, did you miss me? You know, if they miss their cue, there's silence. So every actor has to be prepared to enter the stage at the correct time. That choreography is often done by the CIA person on the ground or the ambassador. Now, I've talked to lots of CIA people who have had direct access to either this information or participated in a coup. And they'll tell you, you know, it's basically, it's not, it's not so complicated. You know, Chuck Kogan, who was the head of direction, directorate of, of operations for the Middle East for many years, used to tell me at great length about the stuff they did. You know, it's, it's not so difficult because you have the whole weight of U.S. institutional power behind you. You know, it's not so complicated. Look, coups are not done by like, you know, the government of Burkina Faso is not conducting a coup against Mali. It's the government of France and the government of the United States with this enormous institutional power. You got to face that. You know, when we talk about coups, they're not happening, you know, like this. Now, just to finish this point, there are coups that come from below. Uh, the attempted coup by Hugo Chavez in 1990, 1992, for instance, it's a coup that failed. These are coups that come from the working class members of the military. We saw that in Egypt, for instance, mm. the coup d'etat of the free officers led by Gamal Abdul Nasser. Those are different. I wrote a book called Darker Nations, where I differentiated between the general's coups and the colonel's coups. It was just a silly way of saying the coups from above a coup sanctified by the oligarchies, a coup sanctified by, you know, the United States or other formerly colonial countries, France and so on. And then the coup from below. These coups from below sometimes are about salaries. You know, low level officers are angry that they haven't received a raise. They do a coup. So you do see coups from below that are not exactly like the coup from above. But this book is mainly focused on the coup from what above. What would you, what's your take on what's happened since 2019 in Bolivia? Is the fact that Janina Nez is now under arrest, does that indicate mm. that, you know, our power abroad to dictate the, uh, you know, governments of other countries, is that an indication that our power is waning in some ways? It seems like the press 
really doesn't know how to respond to what has happened since 2019, almost because the playbook runs out like the usual playbook is okay morales is gone and then that's it and now this interim government's in power and maybe it'll be there for 20 years and we don't have to think about it anymore and now you know we've come back avo's party is back in power and it's sort of like they don't want to totally acknowledge there was a coup but they kind of they're kind of just almost trying to sweep it under the rug at this point so what's your take on um that turn of events It's an excellent question. So l let's compare Bolivia to Honduras because these are opposite comparisons. You know, Honduras uh, after the coup and, and it's a coup government that remains in power, even though there have been elections. It's a coup government. There have been massacres, you know, of anybody putting their head above water, criticizing the government, the killing of Berta Cacares, for instance, the very prominent um, activist of, of the Lenka people against the building of dams. Then the disappearance of Garifuna leaders and so on. Honduras has seen terrible violence, the intimidation of trade unionists and so on. So you can actually succeed. I don't want to use the Bolivia case to say, well, this is a demonstration of the weakening of US power. That would be too much. It puts too much on the Bolivian people. So there are many, many instances in the world, Julia, where United States power quite successfully maintains the oligarchies in control. And by the way, Honduras, the president of Honduras, Mr. Hernandez, his brother is an indicted narco trafficker in US courts. And in the in the filing in the U.S. courts, they say that his brother helped finance Hernand, President Hernandez's run for office. So he has a narco trafficker in power, but he's pro-U.S. So it's all OK. Don't look there, friends. Let's look somewhere else. Let's point fingers at Venezuela or wherever. We don't want to look at, at Honduras. So just to put that out there, you know, uh, they've succeeded. And, and, you know, and it's not me saying that his brother is a narco trafficker. It's not me saying he, he was financed by narco money. It's the U.S. prosecutors who have indicted and found him guilty. OK, this is a, a filing. You can read the court case in the U.S. Uh, district courts, you know, in, in New York City. I mean, you don't even need to take don't take my word for any of what I'm saying. You know, all of this stuff comes from the United States government, one level or the other, their own utterances. Bolivia, it was a grotesque miscalculation by the U.S. ruling class because they thought they would be able to easily intimidate the Bolivian people. And it's got to be said that Evo Morales in 14 years and before Evo Morales is, is government, the movement to socialism mass came to power, you know, from the 1990s, the protests in Cochabamba, the protests all across the country against the privatization of gas, privatization of water, decades of protests in the Cocalero movement before Evo comes to power. Um, and then in that 14 year period, there's a great confidence in the Bolivian people. They were not going to be intimidated. You know, that was clear. I mean, I know this because when I finished writing this, when I finished writing the book, Evo wanted to write the, I mean, Evo wrote the preface to the book. I keep forgetting that. Did he write the preface or the forward? Uh, I keep forgetting that. I think preface is written by the author, forward is written by somebody else, whatever it is. Um, he wrote the forward to the book. And in the forward, he writes, the people are going to triumph. You know, he, he was confident even when he left the country, went to Mexico, then Argentina, he was confident. And they were so confident uh, that they were going to triumph that the coup regime delayed the elections for an entire year. They hid behind the pandemic, but that wasn't the reason. Uh, Mrs. Anias, in fact, had to take herself out of the race because she was polling in the in the single digits. You know, she couldn't even get the the fascists. Uh, to back her, they ran their own candidate, you know. And then Luis Arce and David Chokohenka just triumphed at the polls. Why did they triumph at the polls? Because the people know that the mass is the legitimate voice of Bolivia, not these jokers, you know, these fascists, these actually actual fascists. I don't use this word loosely, you know, these are the children of Klaus Barbie who comes there from Nazi Germany, brings the techniques of Nazi Germany, sets up the intelligence services in Bolivia and so on. The fascistic groups led by people like Camacho and all that, they wear insignia that resembles the old fascists. So, you know, it, it, Bolivia is a particular story. It's a little bit like Venezuela. It's been impossible for the US to, you know, in Bolivia, there was a coup and then the coup was reversed by the people. In Venezuela, the US just can't do a coup. 
The yeah, United we've been States trying. has been trying to overthrow the Yeah, we've, we've been trying. <laughs> yeah, you know, since 1999, the U.S. has been trying a coup there. 2002, there was a formal coup attempt. Just can't succeed. So there are some countries where there's mass mobilization. You know, Cuba is another one where the United States just doesn't succeed. But we should not mistake that for a weakening of U.S. power because I think that's an error. I think, yes... There are places where the United States doesn't succeed, but that should not mean, therefore, that U.S. power is weakened. Right. Um, There's something there was one part in your book where, you know, just now we were talking about, well, there's so many young people that don't really understand this history of the amount of interference the U.S. has done around the world. Uh, and continues to do um, in, through various methods, uh, neocolonial methods, uh, you know, international bodies like the IMF. Um, I guess to me, that's really, it's it's not accidental. It's very deliberate. And at one point you refer to um, sort of uh, corporate media as these sort of stenographers of power. Uh, one thing I was interested in getting your take on is, you know, Russiagate was this huge, um, thing in the U.S. media throughout all of Trump's presidency about how, you know, Russia is just this um, totally rogue state that's doing something that's never been done in modern times, which is intervening in someone's democracy. And for me, that whole story, you know, it was so it turned me off so much like it was so ahistorical the way it was reported. It wasn't it wasn't so much um, the fact that we were talking about Russian interference that was really um disturbing to me it was the way that like the new york times did a huge spread that was like this is just in contravention to every norm of international behavior and for the new york times to say that which is this like very respected outlet and to not mention 50 60 70 years of extreme intervention and assassinations and coups that the u.s participates in obviously you know this is something that's done deliberately so can you speak a little bit to you know the sort of hegemony of corporate media how we challenge that how we um help people understand what america has been doing and and you know your take also on this the russiagate reporting specifically Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I find this very, the story is very interesting because you're, you're right, Julia, you put it very well that the, there was something odd about this Russia gate thing. And, and by the way, I don't respect the New York <laughs> Times at all. It's, I, yeah. But I understand what you mean, that it's respected yeah. out there. I don't respect them. It's, you know, uh, the, the reporting around uh, the, you know, U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, they've never really come clean about right. that. And then the very writer who uh, wrote those stories, what's his name, Michael Gordon, I think his name is, who had shared a byline with Judy Miller at the time, is now writing stories about Wuhan Institute of Virology and the so-called, you know, bioweapon created there, the coronavirus. I mean, it's the same yeah. guy. There's no, co- um, there's no consequences. Wow, as long as you're sort of uh, <laughs> aligned with the political interests of the oligarchical class, they're not going to ever replace you. They're just going to keep letting you do your thing. <laughs> And do the same kind of thing. That's the other thing. I mean, move them to the sports page. Well, they don't really have a sports page, but, you know, move them to the comics. Well, that's the front page. Um, So, uh, you know, uh, in terms of of interference, let me tell you a story that people may not know. In Japan, there's been there's a huge island called Okinawa, south of Japan, which is really it's an enormous landmass. The, almost the whole island is a U.S. military base and has been a base for decades. There's been sustained protest from the Okinawan people because they feel colonized by this base. Um, there are routine stories of rape by U.S. Uh, armed pers- military personnel uh, of uh, young Okinawans, violence, terrible violence visited upon them and so on. And so there's been this long attempt by the people of Okinawa to remove the U.S. base. In 2007 and 8, this picked up. There was a lot of popular support in Japan uh, for the end to the U.S. base at Okinawa. A lot of support inside Japan. And so Mr. Hatoyama comes to power uh, on a liberal uh, ticket, but he promises to uh, consider not expanding the U.S. base in Okinawa. That's the first thing. And secondly, perhaps rolling it back. 
he actually doesn't come out fully and say let's get rid of the us base there he says no expansion and let's dial it back you know and then let's also consider the rules like look i was once in a movie in a mall going to see a movie in seoul south korea and there were us personnel in the mall armed i mean imagine you know you're sitting in washington dc imagine if there was people from the people's liberation army of china roaming around a mall in in washington dc with guns you know you would be like what's going on but it seems perfectly normal in japan in south korea to have armed us personnel roaming around civilian areas in in seoul the big us base you know is right in the heart of seoul so the point is that hatoyama wins the election comes to power starts a modest agenda again it's it's really arben's level reform you know yakob arben's of guatemala was a modest left liberal who wanted to do agrarian reform in his guatemala he was overthrown largely by united fruit company but in this case hatoyama said let's talk about the base and so on obama and hillary clinton were in charge obama was the president hillary clinton secretary of state Hillary Clinton makes noises saying this is outrageous can't be done. Obama goes to Japan refuses to meet Hatoyama in fact refuses to come to the state dinner. They put an immense amount of pressure. They go and talk to other opposition politicians and so on. There is a vote in the parliament and he's overthrown. Now, is that a coup? Is that a coup? What is that a coup against? A man wins the election. His party wins the election on a mandate of removing a base. United States interferes in Japanese domestic politics all the way down to the point where the prime minister has to resign. Uh, nobody in the United States talks about interference in Jap- Japan's domestic internal affairs. There's no there's no US gate. Nothing. It's US totally gate, normal. Yeah. And I, in fact if I if I say this to people they'll laugh and say what are you talking about never even heard of this. You know it's it's hard. What, imagine now. Imagine if the Russian government said we are going to interfere in a congressional election we are going to putin is going to come to the united states so why putin uh, sergey lavrov is going to come to this district in connecticut and is going to meet the people and is going to give a speech and say that this fellow running is a bozo you know you can't b- bring him back we want this other one to win would that be even allowed would sergey lavrov even be allowed to come into the country and behave like that not a chance no. not a chance you know whereas it's acceptable for hillary clinton to directly in a almost directly call for his overthrow although they don't you see they are sophisticated japan is supposed to be an ally so they don't look the us government always it has a long record of interfering with its allies look at the revelations now come from a danish newspaper about routine us interference by spying on european countries including once again by the way it's hardly a secret edward snowden revealed this in 2013 that the us government was spying on angela merkel's cell phone um, now there's revelation spying on the french spying on the germans and so on so isn't this interference i mean isn't this interference it's political interference there's a long history i detailed the elections of the 1950s in germany in france in greece in other countries where the united states paid money to the christian democrats to defeat the left i mean this is on the record again just to be clear to people most of this is written out of the cia's own declassified documents okay this is not me talking to some disgruntled politician in italy this comes right out of cia declassified documents right. this comes out of conversations with the cia Right. Yeah, I always wonder in terms of Russia gate, I always wonder like what do people think the CIA does? Like we have this entire massive intelligence body that's focused on uh the governments of other countries and um spying on them and changing them at will and it's just I I don't know what people think the CIA does if it's not interfering in elections because that's like the main thing that they do. Um we have about 10 minutes left, so I just want to um ask A last question about some other means through which we exercise power that aren't direct coups. Um, you know, in the book, you talk about how as we get into the 70s and 80s, um, the IMF has a lot of uh, power over developing economies. They insist on the institution of structural adjustment programs um, in order to receive 
um, loans fr from the IMF. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. And then if you could also wrap it up with a discussion of the NGOization of uh, public duties. In other words, like, um, you know, in the last few decades, we've seen as these governments are shrinking under the neoliberal economic world order, uh, we have NGOs rushing in to fill that space. And how does that also affect um affect power in those countries and affect what the government can and can't do? It's a great question. You know, some years ago, after he resigned from being the finance minister of uh, Greece, Yanis Varoufakis said that, you know, nowadays to make a coup, you don't need tanks when you have banks. And I think that's a very clear statement because from the 1970s, particularly after the so-called Volcker shock, when the U.S. raised interest rates and really sent um, you know, uh, the public finances of most countries that had borrowed in dollars into a real tease, you know, and, and that's what created the third world debt crisis. From that point, um, international institutions basically controlled by the U.S. Treasury Department uh, could come in with enormous leverage to demand things because these countries needed uh, IMF assistance, World Bank assistance and so on, and that gave leverage. Um, this is what Thomas Sankara, for instance, constantly warned against. And then he was assassinated in 1987 uh, during this period. Um, you know, Fidel Castro tried to create an international uh, debt strike. Countries around the world stopped paying debt servicing. Amazing political initiatives didn't go anywhere. Countries were weakened. And as they were weakened, as they allowed the IMF to come in and dictate policy. Now, talk about interference, you know, to dictate policy. Your own citizens don't have the right to drive your economic policy. The International Monetary Fund um, staff mission comes in and they tell you what to do, how much you should spend on education, health care and so on. So the more you privatize of social welfare, the more you privatize in terms of, of human life, you open that space to the private sector for profit on the one side and secondly for philanthropy on the other. Now this philanthropy business is interesting. In the book I get into the Haiti story where you see mainly US backed philanthropies come in, many of them actually funded by the US government. That's the other interesting story. People don't realize many NGOs, international NGOs funded by the US government. And listen to this, in Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the Americas, the United States government and the NGOs, US funded NGOs fought against the rise of a minimum wage in Haiti. They fought against the rise of a minimum wage in Haiti. I mean, it's people should be embarrassed to hold U.S. passports, frankly. You should be embarrassed to hold a U.S. passport. The United States government is a gangster government. A country like Haiti suffered one crisis after the other. They had the first major um, revolution, you know, of a poor country in 1804. You know, a major revolution written about in the book Black Jacobin, C.L.R. James. Great story. Um, that country has constantly been suffocated by the French, by the United States, so on. The fact that the Americans can, in this recent period, fight against the rise of minimum wage in Haiti is a criminal action. And that was the IMF, the U.S. Treasury Department and U.S. funded NGOs just putting it all together. That's a form of coup d'etat because you're basically not allowing the Haitians their own political agenda. Right. Yeah, no, I remember hearing about that. The Haitians had actually voted for that increase, which was then rolled back. Um, well, Vijay, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I'd love to talk to you for another two hours, but we do have to wrap it up. Um, you know, I hope people will will go out and get the book again. The name of it is Washington Bullets, A History of the CIA Coups and Assassinations. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on again sometime to really unpack some more of this stuff. So so thanks again. Thanks a lot.